Thank you. I am Hyunwoo Kang, and I will be presenting on ICH M7 guideline. I am from uh, Yuhan Chemical. Well, start, uh, M7 has been discussed uh, from many occasions, including last year's MICH guideline training. So I believe that many of you already know the basics of the M7 guideline. So today I'd like to talk about uh, the M7 guideline. Uh, I will remind the major content of it and then as a person who is working at the pharma company, I'd like to share some case studies where this guideline is applied to the field. So I want to say that uh, today's presentation uh, is based on my personal opinion and personal experience. Well, as you can see here, this would be uh, the overview of the M7 guideline, and I will also discuss two case studies, especially the potential nitrous and impurities risk assessment will be mentioned for the case study. So, what is impurity in DS? Well, when it comes to impurity, uh, it exists in DS. However, it is not defined as a DS. It includes all the chemical entities defined as uh, not uh, and the chemical entities. So it includes like small uh, molecule DS and DP. And also, it's unwanted chemicals present in the API or DP arising from normal ma manufacturing. And it has no therapeutic value and it's potentially harmful. And it provides no benefit to patients. And therefore, it needs to be ensured that the level of impurity is sufficiently safe to administer to humans. So impurity actually affects the quality of the pharmaceutical product so that it requires control. So impurities can arise during manufacturing or storage. As you can see from here, uh, from raw materials, uh, we do uh, make the starting materials and that go through the manufacturing process. And during the process, impurities can arise and uh, it can arise from the different stages of the manufacturing and they can these impurities origin and the fate need to be understood and traced in order to have a good process for the drug development. It can be carried over from the raw materials or it can reside in uh, from the uh, starting materials or intermediate. And also it can be like degradation product. It can also generate from the reagent solvent and other others. And it can also be generated from catalyst. So through all these different routes, the potential impurities uh, can be uh, generated. So the impurities can be uh, categorized into like organic impurities, inorganic impurities, residual solvent, uh, polymorphic forms, and anti-automatic impurities. For organic impurities, it can come from starting materials, by product, intermediate, degradation product, and reagent, ligand, and catalyst. For inorganic impurities, it can occur from manufacturing process, which includes reagent, and heavy metal, our or other residual metal in organic salt and other materials. From degradation and synthesis, uh, we do have impurities and whether they have genotoxic or non-genotoxic uh, is really important. And we also have to have some certain control over it. So characterization of the impurities and the control of the impurities were defined in Q3A and B. As you can see for DS, the guidance in uh, the guidance is Q3A and DP for Q3B. And MDD is also set for DS and DP, as you can see from the table. But as for the genotoxic impurities, there are not many descriptions about it. So EMA and the e, uh, FDA uh, produced the relevant guidelines and then um, the genotoxic impurities and their need for the control has been discussed. And there was an approval for the development of the ICHM7. So the discussion started to uh, over the ICHM7, which is about assessment and control of DNA reactive impurities in pharmaceuticals to limit potential carcinogenic risk. So now, 
The M7R2 uh, is the one that we have as a current version, as you can see. For ICH M7 guideline, there are a total of nine sections. So in section one, introduction, scope, general principles, and also considerations for the marketed products are described. In section five, the impurities, uh, what impurities need to be assessed, like the storages, or manufacturings or the story uh, the the DPs the storages the degradations the, or the degradant and the potential the actual impurities need to be assessed and in section six for those impurities the risk assessment the hazard assessment the immunogenicity from class one to five how they can be characterized uh, or the classified is described in section seven. So in section uh, seven, the TTC compound specific and less than lifetime exposure, uh, there are the risk characterization method is described. In section eight, the control strategy is delineated, uh, option one to option four, and the mon regular monitoring and life cycle management are described. In section nine, it is about the regulatory and clinical filings and require the documentation. For this guideline, the scope of the guideline is like this. For new DS and new DP in clinical development and the subsequent application for marketing. And also, the scope includes the certain post-approval submissions of marketed product and also to new marketing application, like changes uh, may generate impurities, new impurities, or uh, increase uh, the range of the impurities, or the changes to the manufacturing process or the formulations and others may increase uh, the range for the impurities. And also the indication or dosage changes if it affects the impurities, and then it will be also included in the scope. So for the general principles, uh, it can be summarized as such on the uh, screen. So it focuses on the DNA reactive substances that have a potential to directly cause DNA damage at a low levels, leading to mutations and also potentially cause uh, cancer. So as a direct method, bacterial immunogenicity assay is used to assess the immunogenic potential and the need for the control. And there are a variety of approaches to conduct this evaluation, including reviewing the available literatures and computational toxicology uh, assessment. And the secondly, the threshold of toxicological concern or TTC concept was developed in order to define an acceptable intake for any unstudied chemical that poses a negligible risk of carcinogenicity or other toxic effects. So the value of 1.5 microgram per day corresponding to a threshold, a 10 to the minus 5 excess uh, lifetime risk of cancer can be justified. And also even below the TTC, high potency neutrogenic carcinogens referred to as the cohort of concern and nitrosol compounds like aflatoxin-like compounds and acyl, uh, acalazole uh, compounds and others. And also there is a concept or the principle of the less than lifetime, which is LTL. So it's based on the lifetime exposure. Usually, the established cancer risk assessment is based on the lifetime exposure, but a higher acceptable limit is possible for drugs in a clinical stage and uh, with a or short administration period. And as for the risk of carcinogenesis uh, caused by impurities, is theoretically set at a level of 10 to the minus five, uh, power of the minus five occurrence rate. With this level, um, uh, theoretically, 
Uh, it's a minor increase uh, compared to the lifetime probability of one in three people developing any type of cancer. So TTC is a theoretical concept, and it's not a realistic indicator of actual risk. And therefore, the TCC calculations are based on assumptions. So exceeding the TCC uh, does not necessarily mean that there is a risk in or the increase in cancer risk. And also, uh, where a potential risk has been identified for an impurity, then the control strategy, uh, leveraging process understanding and analytical control should be developed. So next is the DS and DP impurity assessment. So what need to be uh, assessed? For DS, so during the synthesis and storage, actual and potential impurities need to be uh, assessed. So ICHQ3A defines the actual and potential impurities for actual impurities for the synthetic impurities. It goes over the reported uh, level uh, in the ICHQ3A reporting threshold. So identification of actual impurities is done when the levels exceed the identification threshold in the ICHQ3A. And for the potential impurities, includes starting materials, reagents, synthetic intermediate, and byproduct. And the carryover risk to the DS need to be assessed. And the impurities that are reasonably expected by product in the route of the synthesis from the starting material to the drug uh, substance need to be assessed. For the degradation product, actual impurity includes the degradation products that are present in access of the reporting threshold defined in ICHQ3A. And for, for the potential impurities, uh, they are formed under long-term storage conditions, and they are expected to be formed under long-term storage conditions, including degradation products. So, so they need to uh, include the uh, substances or the DP under long-term storage conditions in the primary packaging. For DP, actual and potential impurities that are likely to arise during manufacturing and the storage need to be uh, studied or the assessed. Next one is hazard assessment element. There are three uh, things that we need to consider. One is the database and the literature search. This is for the carcinogenicity and the bacterial uh, immunogenicity data. And also, the computer genotoxicity prediction program uh, can be used in order to uh, look at the structure activity relationship. And also, expert rule based and statistical based approach can be utilized along with it. And the third one is the in vitro or in vivo testing. In vivo testing suggests the five uh, methods, including uh, transgenic mutation assays. And if the AIMS test is turned out to be positive, then the in vivo testing can be conducted. In accordance with this guideline, impurities can be classified with respect to mutagenic and carcinogenic potential. So here you can see different classes. Class one is the known mutagenic carcinogens. And it needs to be uh, set with a uh, control strategy, class two, known mutagens with unknown carcinogenic potential. And that need to be controlled under the acceptance limit. Class three, um, alerting structure, but unrelated to structure of DS and no mutagenicity data. They need to be controlled under the acceptable uh, limit or conduct bacterial uh, immunogenicity assay. Uh, if it is a non mutagenic, it's a class 5, but mutagenic, then it comes a uh, class 2. Class 4, the same alert in the DS of compounds related to the DS, which have been tested and are not um, mutagenic. Because it's a non mutagenic impurity, it follows Q3 A and B. Class 5, no structure alert or alerting structure with a sufficient data to demonstrate lack of mutagenicity or carcinogenicity. So it's a non-mutagenic impuricity, so control need to follow ICHQ3 A and B. 
So the database and the literature review uh, need to be conducted in order to uh, do the uh, risk assessment. Then the classes are classified into one to five. And but if there is no data available, then bacteria using bacteria mutagenicity uh, testing result can be predicted or expected along with, uh, by utilizing uh, SAR method. Then uh, the impurities can be classified. And depending on the class, uh, meaning that the level of the mutagenicity and the carcinogenicity, the control strategy uh, should be defined. So the database and the literature search. So literature search and the database search need to be conducted in order to find out carcinogenicity and bacterial uh, mutagenicity data. Known uh, mutagenic carcinogen means class one, but positive bacterial mutagenicity data, then it's class two. Sufficient data to demonstrate lack of mutagenicity or carcinogenicity, then it becomes class five. The next one is the computation on toxicology assessment. For bacterial mutagenesis C, um, relationship can be uh, understood by utilizing QSAR or quantitative structure activity relationship. By utilizing computer program known uh, the uh, structure and also pharmacological effects can be predicted. Here, we need to utilize expert rule-based approach, and at the same time, the statistical-based approach need to be utilized together because these two methodologies are complementary with each other. And if there is no alert structure, then there is no concern for mutagenicity and there is no need for the further or additional uh, assay. But if one is positive and the other one is negative, then in order to justify the final decision, there should be some interpretation by the expert. If there is an alert structure, then the MB testing need to be done in order to determine the final result. With the QSAR, uh, we can classify as you can see on the slide. Without uh, the structure alert, it can be class five. With structure alert, and with a relationship with the DS, then class four. There is a structure alert, but no relation with the DS, then class three. And with the AMs attest, there is no mutagenicity, then class five. But if the AMs test is positive, then class two. So class four and five, ICHQ3 A and B apply. The next one is the risk characterization. Based on the hazard assessment that I just mentioned, um, the impurities will be categorized into different classes, class one and two and three. There are acceptable intake level, and there are uh, principles to do that. TTC-based acceptable intake, 1.5 micron, uh, micron uh, gram per day. And Adjusted TCC is applied considering drug administration period and also acceptable intake based on the compound specific risk assessment and also acceptable intake in relation to LTL exposure. For TTC, carcinogenicity and other toxicity, the acceptable intake, there is no such risk uh, need to be uh, set uh, utilizing TCC. So most uh, sensitive animal species. And then uh, the TD50 utilized, uh, there's a TD50 from TD50. So the simple linear extrapolation is conducted uh, with the 10 to the minus 5, the power of the minus 5. For TTC, the DS or the DP where the TTC is applied, the mutagenic impurities can be assessed for the lifetime theoretically. 
1.5 uh, microgram per person per day would be justified with the uh, with the application of the 10 to the power of the minus 5. So the calculation of the TTC is based on the assumptions. So even though when the TTC is exceeded, that does not necessarily mean that there is a risk in the carcinogenic risk. So the TTC-based acceptable intake, which is the 1.5 uh, microgram per day, um, it would be uh, lesser than one in 100,000 over a lifetime of exposure, uh, theoretically. So it's a negligible risk. So exceeding 10 years, the long-term administration for those type of a data, uh, the drug data, so class two or the class three, in this case, the TTC-based acceptable intake approach will be applied. But meanwhile, there is sufficient mutagenicity uh, data, which is the class one. Here, rather than using TTC, the risk assessment is conducted in order to set the acceptable intake. The linear exploration will be utilized so the compound specific acceptable intake will be calculated and also the risk assessment practices used by the international regulatory bodies can also be applied however for the compound uh, similarity if there is a data on it then all known carcinogens compound class will be utilized in order to calculate class-specific acceptable intake for the compound-specific uh, acceptable intake for that impurity. So um, here, the in linear extrapolation and our substances like this one will be calculated based on the permitted daily exposure or PDE. So NOEL need to be confirmed and uncertainty factor in the ICHQ3C as, it, as with the uh, residual solvent uh, that can be utilized for the calculation. In guideline note 4, ethylene oxide is taken as an example as a, a for the linear extrapolation from TD50. So TD50 uh, value out of them here, red and mouse data more uh, conservative data is used, which is the red in this case. So the dose to cause tumor in one in 100,000 animals um, and assumption with that the body weight is the 50 kg. Then the total human daily dose acceptable one is the 21.3 microgram per person per day. So daily lifelong intake of that much of the ethylene oxide would correspond to a theoretical cancer risk of the 10 to the power of the minus 5 and therefore it is an acceptable intake. The next one is the Harbour Rule. This is for the acceptable intake in relation to LTL exposure. By applying this rule, the carcinogenicity or the carcinogenic uh, risk for the long term like the lifetime exposure would be similar to the higher exposure for the shorter duration. So utilizing the Harbour's rule, seven years, sorry, 70 years, TTC of 1.5 microgram per day, if it is applied, then it would be 38.250 uh, microgram. So it shows the linear relationship between the duration and the intake. And with the LTL, you can see the 70 years, 10 years, one year, one month, and most conservative uh, dose can be calculated in here. So lifetime TT, uh, TTC uh, can be applied with the LTL so that the total exposure day can be distributed with the 38.25.
As you can see from the table, the TTC application in case of less than lifetime, uh, so if the uh, there's a very short exposure of the uh, drug, then you can set a very uh, short uh, setup time. And, and the drug that is used in intermittently, the actual dose days are used. So if it's been used about once every week for two weeks uh, for a year, that would be 104 days. And if the two, 20 microgram would be uh, permitted or allowed uh, dose. But if there is a multiple gen uh, genotoxic uh, imperative, then you would uh, supply apply these uh, criteria. And so according to the drug substance with three or more class two or class three impurities, they should be set in the set as specification. And this is the a table that you have to use for the daily intake with the multiple uh, impurities. Not just for the, uh, the uh, a, for, uh, this also applies for the API. And also a class of related uh, impurities. That is uh, class one. For these types of impurities, well, they would be uh, they would not be included in the allowed uh, permit or the limit of class two or the class uh, three. And so they would not be uh, included in the total allowed dose or volume. Next is control strategy. If the impurity is a class one, two, or three, in that case for the DS, for the DP, the uh, impurity uh, sh should be uh, within or below the acceptance uh, limit. And chemicals related to manufacturing process, well, that knowledge about that is quite needed in order to create uh, the relevant control strategies. And the control strategies are needed in to minimize the risk. So in terms of the process the design as well as analytics, so the per there needs to be a participation by uh, the relevant uh, personnel as well as for the experts. And also, uh, so there are uh, four uh, options are available. So uh, let's look at these options. In case of control option one, this is test for the impurity in the drug substance uh, specification with an acceptance criteria at or below the acceptable limit. And according to ICHQ6A, a periodic verification test can be set and applicable if less than 30% of the standard is detected in six consecutive pilot batches or three actual production batches. In case of control options, this is the uh, test uh, for the impurity in the specification for raw material, starting material, or intermediate, or as in uh, in-process control with an acceptance of criterion at or below the acceptable uh, limit. And this is control option three. Just as uh, control option two, this is the test for the impurity in the specification for raw material, starting material, or intermediate, or as an in process control with an acceptance a criterion above uh, the acceptable uh, limit. And this option uh, can be uh, justified when the level of impurity in the drug substance will be less than 30% of the acceptable limit, or when under uh, the, the uh, the necessary uh, where the necessary supported by data from pilot scale or commercial scale batches are available and as for the control option four uh, so there, if there's a sufficient confidence that the level of the impurity in the drugs drug substance will be, be below the acceptable limit and so we, rather than doing analytical uh, test through the process uh, control uh, will be uh, used in order for this uh, control option and so for the impurity does not need to be listed on any specification. And if in case the process chemistry and process parameters, the impact the levels of metogenic impurities are understood and the risk of impurity residing in the final drug substances above the acceptable limit is uh, determined to be uh, negligible. And the, the pause effector, expected pause effector can also be applied here. So uh, let's summarize option one, will be uh, monitoring the impurities in the drug substance and uh, the acceptance of cr uh, criterion will be below the TTC. In case of option two, it will be used to monitor the impurities in the intermediate starting material or in process control. Just as option one, the acceptance criterion will be below the TC TTC. And option three, just like option two, will be monitoring the impurities in the intermediate starting material or in process control. 
However, the acceptance criteria uh, will be above the TTC. An analytical method coupled with the understanding process parameters and knowledge of the fate and purge will be uh, required. And as for option four, instead of analytical test, uh, there has to be designing of robust process controls to reduce the risk of impurity level above the TTC to be negligible. I have uh, talked about uh, the uh, the overviews of the ICHM7. Now I'm going to uh, talk about uh, nitrosamine uh, impurities, which is a COC. We, my company has conducted risk assessment for the potential of uh, nitrosamine impurities. I'm going to talk about this. In 2018, uh, there was uh, an issue related to this. And so the uh, risk assessment, assessment for the potential nitrosamine impurities have become an important issue. And in our company, in accordance with the instructions of the regulatory authority is doing uh, this risk assessment. And in case one is uh, about the risk of sediment for potential nitrosamine impurities in active pharmaceutical in ingredient that's rose fastin and calcium. And as for the uh, risk assessment, well, there are two parts to the risk assessment for the presence of N uh, nitrosamines. First is related to risk identification, and second is risk characterization and confirmatory uh, testing. Uh, there has to be checking of the sources of a nitrosating agent as well as the potential contamination risks, the sources of, of secondary and tertiary amines, acceptable level determination, and the conducting formation, fade and purge assessment, and also nitrosamine. Uh, whether the nitrosamine can be uh, formed, and there has to be a, a post-confirmatory uh, uh, testing. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the rostam and calcium uh, synthesis uh, scheme. And so the uh, triethylamine is used, and also uh, the uh, dithyl, uh, dithyl amine is also used, but we did not use nit so nitrosamine. And so there was no, uh, uh, pro so we thought there would not be any formation of nitrosamines. But in the PTS, the uh, penitetrazocyanol in that uh, creation of that process, the sodium nitrolite is employed, that is known to be the case, uh, but because no aluminum is uh, used, so nitrosamine uh, impurities, so there was no possibility of the uh, nitrosamine, of nitrosamine being formed. So we have confirmed that. And the sodium nitrolite, if this resides and through the secondary amine, and if it can cause NDA or MDMA, if those uh, the uh, uh, impurities are formed. But in our uh, manufacturing post, NDA and DMA are very uh, highly soluble in water. And so during our process, what a manufacturing process, the worker process, we believe that they can be uh, uh, eliminated. So we thought that the risk would be quite low. And so this was what we've done. And so uh, this is the final outcome of the risk evaluation for the uh, rosovastatin calcium API. We have done overall risk assessment for the nitrosamine impurity presence, and we have uh, uh, eval by evaluating the individual risk contribution from the API manufacturing process, water used in the manufacturing process, raw materials, cross contamination during the manufacturing process, and packaging materials. And the final outcome was that there's a very low risk of the presence of nitrosamine impurities in rosovastatin. Uh, and calcium API, and uh, they are uh, could be included as a tetra tetraamine, so that we, uh, it's generated in raw materials. However, uh, nitrosamines uh, uh, characteristics and about uh, the uh, because of our manufacturing process step that we have, so the because of the nitrosamine impurities generated, uh, so those impurities will can be easily uh, eliminated in the overall night uh, the manufacturing uh, process. And what we have actually uh, manufactured, which is the uh, rose, uh, so rose vested and calcium API, we have done three uh, consecutive uh, uh, batches. We have checked for the impurities uh, for the potential NDMA and NDEA, and we have done uh, the confirmatory uh, test. And the uh, maximum daily dose or the MDD uh, is uh, divided 
is this. So our AI is divided by LMDD. So that's the acceptable natural amine a content. And so this was 96 program nanogram and and for the rostabin MDD is about 40 milligram. And so if you divide that, uh, the allowed amount is about 2.4 ppm or uh, 0.66 uh, uh, ppm for NDMA and NDEA uh, of, uh, respectively. And so uh, according to the ICH M7, with you there has uh, consist if there is you know, consistently less than 30% uh, of the uh, this uh, single uh, mutagenic impurity in the drug substance, then it is uh, acceptable. And the CHMP further agreed with the second QWP response that to justify omission from the sophistication, it has been we demonstrate that the level of the respective single nitrosamine is consistently at or below 10% of the ICH M7 and limit. And so, uh, so with the, our validated method for the six uh, batches that we have produced, we have done the assessment as well as the uh, overall evaluation. And so this is the results of the confirmatory uh, testing. And so uh, this is the, as the test results of the validated LCMS and uh, MS method, NDMA and NDEA impurities were not detected in six batches. And so in the uh, manufacturing process of rosavastatin calcium AP, API, uh, we have uh, been able to uh, prove that there's no risk of a uh, nitrosamine uh, formation in the manufacturing process. And next is the case study two. And this is about the risk assessment for potential nitrosamine impurities in the manufacturing process uh, with a quenching a solution. And so X, that is the API intermediate. That is the uh, product that we'll soon be uh, producing. And according to our SOP, in the overall manufacturing process, we have uh, looked at all the theoretical risks uh, for all the potential uh, sources of nitrosamines. And we have also analyzed all the, uh, the potential impurities in product at risk uh, for the confirmation of the risks if identified. And then uh, we, uh, we further established actions to mitigate the risks. And these are the process uh, steps and reactions uh, involved uh, with this product X. And uh, these are the list of the uh, APIs, or the raw materials used uh, for the AI. So uh, there is azide, salt is used. And in terms, this is highly uh, reactive, highly explosive. And so in quenching, we uh, need to uh, uh, be uh, the head of processing, and then sodium nitrate, nitrite is used as a nitrosating agent. So from the amine source and nitro source, a uh, meat uh, in this process, and nitrosamine uh, impurities could uh, potentially be formed. And so this risk assessment of potential nitrosamine impurity was carried out by referring to the EMA QNA document and the CMDH uh, template and was applied to all manufacturing steps of this uh, product X. And, tri and triethyl alamine was is used during the uh, X manufacturing process, but there's no risk of potential nitrosamine impurities during the manufacturing process because no nitrosating agent is used. However, the risk of NDEA formation was confirmed as sodium nitrate, which is a nitrosating agent, was used during the quenching process uh, for the disposal of the separated water layer and acid conditions were established by a uh, sulfuric acid. And this, support, uh, this uh, potential nitrosamine the uh, nitrous amine is not carried over to the next step, but it could reside, it could still remain. And so that is why in the uh, water, the uh, the reactors, uh, so there could be a potential risk in, in the reactors with the water. And so because of the reactor, uh, the, in, uh, this could have a, a, a possibility of, a, of cross contamination for other products that could be uh, uh, produced using this uh, reactor. And ICH M7 guideline allows, as I've uh, explained before, uh, approach, uh, based approaches as a control strategy in 
instead of analytical testing. This is option four. And option four control strategy has to be supported with a risk assessment considering um, the impact of physiochemical properties of the PMI on its fate and purge. And this is how uh, the purge factor is calculated. And and as I said in the beginning part of my presentation, and the impurities are generated during the production and the storage uh, process, and they could also be oxided at that process. And how much? And so, it, and the part factor is the one that is used to calculate how much of such impurities are purged, and the existing uh, the concentration of the uh, impurities uh, would be calculated about the uh, with the overall uh, with with this uh, purge factors, and the uh, the calc this is how uh, shows how the cal the overall purge factor is calculated. And as for the purge ratio for the control strategy, uh, the level of the the impurity has to be below the allowed limit. That's uh, what the purge ratio is, and the purge uh, ratio says that the uh, the uh, the, if the uh, the end result is uh, closer to uh, the limit, the higher uh, the risk, and if the risk is higher, uh, there has to be more higher level of information or the data is needed. And so, if the purge radio the ratio is more than uh, more than one thousand, which is option four, and there's no evidence that's actually needed. If the purge ratio is between one hundred and one thousand, and the purge uh, calculation, uh, the literature evidences, and also purge calculation and the test data uh, would be required. And if the purge ratio is below one hundred, then there needs to be more a conservative uh, method, uh, such. Uh, and if the purge ratio is less than one, that uh, then option four cannot be supported, and purge factor cannot be used either. And uh, next is about the ways to calculate the purge factors, and the this is based on the physiochemical uh, parameters. And so you'd see how they are calculated, what the definitions are. And as here, uh, physiochemical uh, parameters are reactivity, solubility, volatility, and also other uh, physiochemical uh, processes. And also, as for the uh, calculation, uh, the definitions are shown here on this table. In terms of reactivity, there's high reactivity as well as moderate reactivity and low reactivity. So there are three classes of reactivity, and the rating could be 10, 100, 10, and 1. And as for the solubility of definitions, uh, there is a freely uh, soluble, and there is a moderately soluble, and there is a sparingly uh, soluble. Those are three uh, classes, and the rating is 10. Uh, and as you can see, these are the ratings you see on the table. And the in these power processes, uh, not uh, most of them are but quite needed of uh, widely, but depending on the processes and uh, some other uh, physiochemical parameters besides the ones that I've mentioned could be used. And uh, next is about the purge ratio uh, calculation. Initial concentration would be the uh, would be a uh, calculated based on the starting level. This is a uh, microgram per uh, gram. And as for the safe limit, that would be divided uh, AI divided by uh, MDD. And as for uh, the required purge factor, uh, so the initial concentration that we calculated uh, in the beginning uh, would be divided by the safe limit, and and uh, this would. Be. Uh, so this uh, would show the purge factor that would be needed for the uh, purging, and the purge ratio. Ha of course, it has to consider the of uh, the uh, uh, physical chemical uh, parameters, and those would be uh, uh, would be a predicted purge factors and actually measure the purge factors, and they would be a uh, required uh, purge factors. So the predicted purge factor divided by required purge factor would be uh, the purge ratio. So a uh, conclusion is this: so the option for a uh, purge ratio has to be more than one thousand.
So you can control the parameters or improve the processes to reduce the risks. And that was our strategy at our company. And at the same time, the the imperatives uh, from uh, the uh, the drug of uh, production uh, initially, if it's one percent and MPF is one thousand, and then measured uh, per factor would be about as I said uh, one thousand, and if this can be the PPM and then decide divide by CPPM, that would be you know simple one thousand. And if the uh, allowed uh, permit is one one hundred, and the required would be would be about 100 because that would be required to reduce from 1%. And also a required part factor, there, we, there has to be information about the processes in order to do the calculation. So the part factor, uh, if that is divided by the required part factor, you will be able to get a part ratio. And uh, the uh, for the process, uh, so uh, there has to be a number to see, you know, there's a full uh, purging of the impurities. And so uh, per higher the purge ratio, as I said, higher the confidence. And if the purge ratio is low, then uh, the, whether there's a purge uh, that has occurred in the process and how much purging has been done in the process, well, there will be less confidence for that. And next is uh, about calculating a uh, predicted purge factor uh, for X, X uh, which is our API intermediate. And, and this is how the end, uh, this uh, is about the west uh, quenching step and about the washing um, um, process that is the, uh, the rinsing of the reactors. We have actually calculated purge factor for that uh, reactor. In order to do this calculation, uh, the physiochemical uh, pro uh, parameters, that is the reactivity, solubility, or the volatility, and other uh, physical or uh, chemical parameters have to be reviewed. So we have done that review, and then we've done the, uh, the rating, and then did the calculation. So after we've done the calculation theoretically in our process, uh, the uh, the part factors were as you can see, and so the overall overall it was one hundred thousand. So that was the predicted part factor uh, for our product. And if I may give you a more additional explanation, uh, related the reactor cleaning. So if the solution uh, initially we used methanol and then we used water. So those are these uh, solutions that we used and methanol and it, it has very low solubility for the NDEA because that was the why uh, the solubility was one. But water is very uh, solu uh, soluble. So that is why solubility was 10. And if methanol, uh, so whether the, uh, is methanol needed for that process or uh, when we have actually done the testing, well, the uh, because the uh, the quenching uh, solution is a waste solution, I mean, there are some uh, dirty elements. Uh, for instance, within the reactors, there could be some slurries uh, that are attached to the wall. When uh, uh, cleaned with water, they could not be uh, easily washed, and so we needed organic uh, solutions, and. And so, that, which means that we would need methanol because methanol has, uh, you know, higher solubility for such uh, substances. So we did the washing with the methanol, and after that, uh, for the chemical washing, we used water as the uh, as the uh, the media for rinsing. As in order to get a measured uh, purge factor. And uh, we have uh, used uh, this uh, LCMS method uh, for uh, for uh, the uh, quantification of NDEA in the manufacturing process of X. So we think the NDEA is going to be formed, but act, I mean, is it really formed? And if it is formed, how much would it be formed? 
and how would the impurities uh, be eliminated? So in our process, uh, in, uh, by the process that we've set, can we really eliminate that? And if we did that, and so how much elimination would there be? This was really, uh, we were uh, quite curious about this. And so we did the risk assessment and then uh, we actually did the risk assessment and about the theoretical in the EA uh, formation in the quenching and solutions we saw whether there was in the EA and through the washing process of how much uh, in the EA is purged and so uh, we have used LCMS uh, method and then we did the analytical uh, testing and uh, with the quenching solution and the EA uh, was about 1 ppm. So we were able to see that NDEA was uh, formed and through the washing um, process, NDEA decreased uh, gradually. And so this washing uh, process has a purging effectiveness and it actually does uh, uh, the purging. And uh, there's something that we're doing additionally, and that is to check the purge factor in a more uh, quantitative way. And so we would do a spiking. And so that is a, a spiking test. And we would use a quenching uh, solutions. And the quenching uh, solutions would, inc uh, we would include many you know, organic uh, substances. And so we, for that, the we also have done optimization for the method of validation. And with that study data, we have done, uh, in conclusion, we said that the washing methods and the, uh, the uh, number of washes, we were able to get, uh, we believe that we will be able to get a strategy that will be effective, not just a theoretical risk assessment, but with the analytical testing, uh, the, we have uh, created a strategy to eliminate or to purge nitrosamines, and that is what matters. And lastly, about the regulatory uh, consideration related to uh, uh, the purging. Purging. We have looked at a material, several materials, and I see HM7 talks about our assessment of genotoxicity and control strategy that are required for setting of specification for drug substance and drug product in all phases of product life cycle. And currently, uh, health authorities accept a sound scientific rationale for genotoxic impurities that are based on theoretical purge argumentation and supportive uh, analytical uh, data. And so the validation of a theoretical purge argumentation with real experimental data from the purge study Study is essential to achieve a high level of acceptance. With this, I would like to end my presentation about the uh, the summary of the ICH WM7 as well as uh, our actual uh, risk assessment with the uh, nitrosamine. I want to thank you for your attention.